Um, so my name is Roman. Um, I'm going to talk about the project Lilliput, um, which is about compressing the object headers and uh, therefore reducing the memory footprint. Um, I want to divide this into two parts. In the first part, I want to talk about what we achieved so far. So we, we have already uh, reached a uh, milestone with what we call Lilliput 1. Um, I'm going to talk about how uh, we achieved that. And then in the second uh, part, I want to uh, look a little bit into the future, what we are planning to do, and um, talk, a, talk a little bit about the ideas that we have, and maybe plant uh, some of the problems in your head so that maybe some of you can uh, also uh, find ways to solve the problems that we see. Um, so let's start with a little overview here. Um, let's consider uh, a kind of very small heap. Um, each of the rectangles in, in uh, this heap represents uh, objects of different sizes. And um, I added yellow boxes here. Each box represents like one word, so 64 bits of information. And um, the little yellow boxes here, um, those are the object headers. So uh, this is a kind of a typical situation in Java heaps. You have um, kind of uh, quite a lot of um, space taken by the object headers. And what we want to do is um, reduce this a little bit so that we can save the memory. So what we have in Lilliput is, look, would look like this. We would take only one word instead of two words for the object header, which is a bit of an approximation, but um, that might look like this. And the, the greenish space is what we would save. Um, another way to look at this might be this. So if, if this is the live data on your heap, um, then the, the blue parts are the actual information, the payloads, and the yellow parts are the metadata that we have in the, in the object headers. Um, so we made, when we started the project, we made some experiments and we, we um, examined a lot of different workloads and we found that uh, on average, like 20% of the live data on the heap is actual object headers. Your mileage may vary if you have workloads with like very large, a lot of very large objects, and this might be much less. Uh, workloads with lots of tiny objects have much more uh, header information on the heap. Um, so this is the current situation that we have with uh, headers that are 12 bytes in size. I will get to that later. With uh, Lilliput, we, we want to reduce this to headers that are only 8 bytes in size, which means that we can reduce uh, the, the uh, amount of live data on the heap by uh, about 13%, no, now only 13% of live data on heap is um, object headers and the reduction would be around seven to 10% uh, savings. Could be more if you have workloads like this, but yeah. With the, what we want to do in the future, the Lilliput 2, uh, we want to reduce this to uh, even smaller headers like four byte headers per object. Uh, in this case, we would only have like six to 7% of live data on the heap in object headers and save like up on average around 14% but could be up to 50% savings. Um, to, to show more um, um, concrete example, we, we have, um, so we have backported the, what we have called Lilliput 1 to JDK 17 and given it to some of our um, services. I, I cannot tell you which ones, I cannot, give you the exact numbers, but we can talk about percentages here. Um, and we, we see here, so this, the, the little bar where, where uh, the little red bar is where they uh, deployed Lilliput. It's the exact same workload, exact same uh, instance size, exact same uh, JVM actually, because we have a little switch to change it. Um, and at the point where we switch to Lilliput turned on, we, we, uh, sa we are saving about like 30% of heap memory. Um, this is the heap usage after GC. It doesn't show the, the typical sawtooth pattern here because I, I, I want to, to see the effect, but um, this also has the effect that the, that the slope of the sawtooth is a bit flatter than before, which also implies that there are that the frequency of GCs, that the, uh, the interval between GCs is um, much longer, which means um, that we are also saving a lot of 
uh, CPU utilization. So the uh, CPU utilization dropped by about 25%. Um, this is also um, caused by better locality. So um, having smaller object size means we can fit more objects into the CPU caches, which makes everything a little bit faster. So this dropped significantly when we um, turned the liquid on here. Um, and this in turn also has an effect to improve latency for um, yeah, user requests um, by like about 30%, which is quite nice. Um, I want to make a little excursion here. Um, if you want to have an estimate for your particular workload, how Lilliput would affect this, um, there's a nice tool um, which is called JOL, Java Object Layout, I think it means. Um, it, and you can feed a heat dump into this tool and it will give you estimates. And the, the thing about heat dumps is um, most tools are lying to you about this because heat dumps are not saving the header data of objects. They only save the actual fields and well, the payload of an object. And all the, the heap dump analysis tools, they give you estimates and they are normally they are wrong because there are so many factors that play into this. Um, like whether or not you're running with compressed references or compressed uh, class pointers, whether you're running with a pre or post JDK 15, and now we have Lilliput also playing into this. And um, JOL can give you estimates for all these kind of um, different configurations um, with a single heap dump that doesn't even have to be a Lilliput enabled JDK. So you see here, let me, can I change to, yeah. Can you see this? No, you can't, okay. Bad. All right, um, so it's hard to see here, but um, so the savings, Alexei run the heap dump of, of a um, JetBrains Sea Lion um, IDE, and he found that with, with Lilliput, you, you would save about like, what's that? 9% uh, of heap memory with the, what we have now, Lilliput 1, and even, it can even look into the future with an estimate something that doesn't even exist, Lilliput 2, you would save about like 18, what is that, 13% of heap memory, I think. But that's quite nice, um, check it out if you want. Um, what does all of that mean? So the, the uh, this, this service team that I showed you before that has this um, nice savings, they have a new choice to make. They can now uh, either reduce their hardware cost, they can throw out hardware and, or reduce their cloud cost, or they could use the same hardware and drive more load on it which amounts to the same thing, basically. Um, they would also save uh, money on the energy bills and save CO2, which is great, um, yeah. So let's start to look at to what we um, have done so far and um, the problems that we encountered and how we uh, solved them. So I will start out with a little introduction and then go into the other topics that we find. Um, so what is in the object headers? Um, so now we go deep into the Build level. So the, the first um, row here is the is what's the what we call the mark word in an object. So this is the very first word of every object in the uh, hotspot of an JDK. Um, and there's I, I, I uh, show you all the bits here. So to the very right you see what's called the lock bit or kind of a tag bit. Uh, it's two bits there which which. Uh, are mostly used for locking, but also for other purposes. Then there's an unused bit, which is interesting for historical purposes. That used to be the bias locking bit. Um, then there's four bits that describe the object age. So when the GC um, copies objects, they, they age, and the GC increases the age, and at some point it gets promoted to the old generation. This is that. Um, there's another unused bit here, which I don't know wh why. So this is just just there, then, then here we have a lot of bits here. This is 31 bits for the identity hash code. Um, and then there's another, another bunch of unused bits here. Um, and in the second word of each object, you will find the class pointer, which is usually starting from JDK 15. It's, uh, it's compressed by default, and this is what basically everybody uses. So uh, I don't know. It could also be an uncompressed class pointer, in which case it would be 64 bit and take the whole word, but usually it's just 31, 32 bits and takes half a word. Um, and then next to this would be either the first couple of fields, like an int field would fit there, uh, or maybe uh, four byte fields, or, and arrays, uh, they, they store their array length there. So this is um, another in interesting point. Um, the 
basic insight that we had with Lilliput is that most objects never get um, identity hash code and most objects never get locked. So much of this information in the mark world is only used by basically few objects. Uh, you, you probably notice where I'm getting here with all these unused bits and the, this insight here. Um, but there's one big problem because the mark word can look quite different in a few cases. When uh, the object is locked or when the GC is doing some stuff with the object, it may uh, be overwritten by a what is actually the na native pointer. And then we have a, the tag bits in the lower two bits which kind of identify what this pointer actually means. Um, and we have basically three, four situations. So the default situation is uh, when this bet these tag bits are zero and one, then it's the usual mark word. In the other three cases are, um, could be a pointer into the stack, could be a pointer into an object monitor, or it could be a pointer into a forward, to a forwarded object um, when the GC is forwarding this. Um, in those cases, the mark word would be decoded, meaning the, the tag bits would be masked out and then we interpret it as a native pointer basically. Um, what happens to the original mark word? Because if it contains like important information, like a hash code, we don't want to lose it. So what happens then is the mark word gets displaced. This is how we call this, displaced, displaced mark word, which, which means that the original mark word is stored in, uh, usually in the data structure that the native pointer points to. For example, um, if you have an object monitor, um, then the original mark word would be stored in the first field there, this is called displaced mark word field, and then we can find the original mark word when we want to restore it. Um, the plan with Lilliput is to merge the um, compressed class pointer into the object headers, use all those unused bits, and then um, basically save the second word here for the class pointer. Um, the difficulty is that um, compared to what we already have in the mark word, the, the compressed class pointer is uh, kind of much more crucial as a very uh, like important information that it needs to be accessed very frequently and um, we must not lose it because if an object loses the class pointer, it uses, loses all the uh, interesting information. Um, yeah, let's talk about those class pointers a little bit. So um, currently, it's in a separate word. Um, as I said, it's very crucial information for an object. It's, it's used for runtime uh, type information, like uh, when we need to do an instance of or a check cast or something like this. It's important for doing virtual calls so that we can find uh, the, the target uh, methods to, to do the calls on. It's used for reflection and so on. So it's very frequently accessed. It's a very hot uh, piece of information that we have there. Um, and what we do in Lilliput, we basically simply move it into the, um, into the uh, mark word, into the object header. Um, we always uh, enforce um, compressed class pointers. We don't use uncompressed class pointers with Lilliput, it's not possible. Um, in order to do that, we need to um, kind of shrink the, the identity hash code a little bit to 25 bits, um, which means that um, it may lead to some reduction in performance for very large hash tables, for example. So the fidelity of the identity hash code is a little bit reduced. Um, however, we have um, work in progress by Thomas Stüffel, he's working on that to, to the opposite side, so to, to, to make the compressed class pointers a little bit, little bit smaller and then keep using the original 31 bit that we have for the identity hash code instead. Um, most of the problems and most of the, the uh, challenges with Lilliput revolve around the question, how can we safely access the class pointer? Because uh, if it's displaced, then it becomes a bit difficult. Um, so yeah, I will show us some answers to that question. Um, the first problem is, um, I will cover that is stack locking. So when, so stack locking is the, uh, kind of the simplest locking primitive that we have in the hotspot JVM for Java locking. It uh, coordinates um, threads by compare and swapping uh, in, the mark um, in the mark word. 
Um, it doesn't support, uh, so it doesn't support any contention, it doesn't support uh, wait notify, it doesn't support JNI, so it's very, very primitive. Um, if any of this happens, then we inflate it, this is how we call it, we inflate it to a full object monitor, in which, at which point it, will, it becomes a monitor locked object, which is a different thing. Um, so how does it work? So we, it's basically a very simple thing. It, um, it compares, compare and swaps a, uh, pointer into the uh, thread stack into the mark word, which with the lowest two bits set to zero, which means that this thing is basically a pointer into the stack. And at this pointer, so at this location where it points to in the, in the thread stack, there's the original uh, mark word. Um, and the reason we do this is to, to be able to answer the question given a thread T and an object O, uh, is this thread T uh, locking the object O here? Um, which is not quite the same question as which thread is locking O. If we, want to, if we want to find out which thread is locking the object O, then we would have to scan all the threads in the system uh, to find out. Um, using this scheme, we can, we can easily answer this question because we can look at the, uh, the, the, the pointer and then check if the current threads stack is in this range, and if it is, then yes, that's the thread that locks out. So this is why we do this. And we also do this in order to be able to basically restore the original mark word. However, this is a big problem for Lilliput because what if we want to access the, uh, the class pointer? This is the, the, the question, right? Um, we could say, okay, let's follow this pointer and look at the original mark word that we just saved on the stack. However, this is very dangerous because it's racy. Um, if the, the uh, thread that is locking the object is unlocking the object, then we could basically uh, reach out to some unknown value on, on, on the stack and would basically crash there. So this is racy with uh, actually unlocking the, the um, stack. So the solution that we came up with um, is to not uh, store the stack pointer into the mark word and instead um, have a little uh, what we call a lock stack as a, a structure inside the Java thread structure. It's not, not on the stack, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a separate small stack which is uh, currently I think it's just eight entries um, because we observed that we uh, each thread only locks, usually locks very few objects at the same time. Um, it's hardly ever exceeding five locked objects at the same time. We, sometimes we see it exceeding the eight uh, entries that we have here, but usually it's just about three or four or so. Um, so and when, when, we, um, when an object gets locked by a thread, then we push that uh, object reference onto this lock stack, and this is how we can still answer this question. Is this thread locking this object? We scan this lock lock stack, and usually we find the answer at the first or second entry from the top. Um, and this way we can really quickly still answer this question. It's not, still not the same answer that we have, uh, the same question as which thread is locking off. So this is basically doing the same thing, and we don't need to um, use a native stack pointer in the mark word, which is how we preserve uh, the upper bits that we need. Um, we still flip the bits in the two lowest uh, bit to, uh, to indicate that this is um, locked, so we can still compare and swap on the mark word and uh, yeah, coordinate the threads. Um, it was a very short summary of this quite complex thing. I, I basically scratched the surface here. I, uh, <laughs> um, as a side note, um, this is, has been a very long running PR, and thanks to all folks who have contributed this, there's a lot of folks who have shown in ideas, who tested it, who, who uh, reviewed this thing, and this PR itself went through four iterations of basically reboots. It took more than one year, and the final, even though only the final PR collected over 400 comments and hundreds of comments, so this was a huge uh, like challenge, and yeah. But it ended up in uh, JDK 21, and it's under a flag. It's um, not, not, very, not very useful by itself, but it will be useful for Lilliput. So the, um, that's 
when we inflate a lot, this, I mentioned this earlier, when, when uh, contention happens or JNI or uh, object uh, weight notify happens, then the lock needs to be inflated, which we call monitor locking. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of details here. I'm just saying that when that happens, then we also have a native pointer in the object header. We have different tag bits here, which indicate that it's object locked. And I just want to say that it's not a big problem for Lilliput because we here we can safely, kind of safely access the um, mark word in the in the object monitor because um, the monitor deflation um, is coordinated with Java threads and now also with GC threads, so we can safely reach through this pointer and see the original mark word and the uh, compressed class pointer that we have there. So it's not a problem yet. Um, what else? The other big um, problem is GC forwarding. Um, we want to give a, give a quick overview about this. It's also a quite deep topic. Um, so we have like uh, five different GCs, and both uh, most of the GCs have two different kind of modes, which is the normal GC that happens like all the time, and kind of an emergency last ditch GC, which is called we call the full GC is. Uh, happens when heap runs out of space and we cannot reasonably copy something, then we need to like uh, do a full collection and uh, squeeze the object last last uh, last pieces of memory out of the heap. Um, and they, they use different algorithms here. So the normal GCs for most of the uh, GCs in, in Hotspot, they use uh, a copying collection with, and the way that we Store the forwarding pointer is uh, by uh, copying the object to a new location and store um, heavy pointer to the new location in the object header. Then there's the um, full GCs of the serial, the G1 and Shenandoah. They use a sliding collection, which means I get to this later. Um, means that we we slide all the live objects to the bottom of the heap, and this is a bit more tricky to to realize with um, forwarding pointers. Then parallel GC uses a kind of a different algorithm for the full GC. It's a kind of schizo GC, which is not a problem for Lilliput. And set GC is using a separate forwarding table, which is also great because it doesn't touch the header and it's not generally a problem. Uh, as far as I know, set GC doesn't do any like emergency full GC, so this is not applicable there. So about um, the GC forwarding. So this is very similar to the other cases with locking. Um, when that happens, when the GC, GC, GC needs to copy an object, it stores the uh, pointer to the new location in the mark word, and it flips the lowest two bits to one and one, indicating that this is a forwarding pointer, and uh, it points to, usually points to a uh, new object which has the original mark word. Um, this is the case for the so-called copying collections or copying forwarding, uh, where we have a new copy of the same old object, uh, which has the actual original mark word, and the, the original object has a forwarding pointer to the new object. This is an easy case because here we can uh, reach through the forwarding pointer, see uh, the original mark word in the new object, and can uh, kind of access the class information from there. Um, there's a special case when um, doing a copying collection it could run us out of space while trying to copy. And what what the GCs do then? They they install what is called a kind of a self forwarding, indicating that the uh, copying failed. And then later it doesn't need to clean up and recover from this somehow. But for our purposes, this means that the forwarding pointer in the object points to the object itself, which is a problem because then we don't have a new copy of the object where we store the mark. So what what happens to that now? Um, currently, it's, it stores the interesting header. So if, if the header is uh, locked or has an identity hash code, then it's stored in the site structure, which is only very few objects. Um, we cannot realistically do this with Lilliput because suddenly all the headers are interesting because they have the class pointer information. So if we would store them to a site structure, we would have a very large site structure, and this is not really an option. Um, so what we do there instead in Lilliput is um, we don't store the forwarding pointer to the object itself. We only flip another bit here, the, the third bit, which we call self-forwarded tag, to indicate that this is a self-forwarded object. Um, 
and and this way we preserve the the other bits in the object header, which is yeah useful for us. Um, this is kind of an easy case too. The most problematic case is um, in the full GCs when we need to do the sliding forwarding. And the sliding forwarding works like this. It, it's um, it basically implemented in four passes, uh, the GC. So the idea is if you have a heap full of objects, then we identify uh, all the objects that are reachable, and then we slide all the reachable objects to the bottom of it, and thereby um, making, a, making space for new allocations. Um, so this happens in the first phase of it is uh, actually identifying the um, reachable objects by what we call marking from the GC rules. We traverse the heap. Everything that we see, we mark, and everything that is not marked is not reachable. So the objects that are in this pink boxes here, they are basically not reachable. And then in the second pass, we go over all the um, reachable objects and compute the new location. We don't copy it yet. We only compute the new location and store this new location in the object header as a kind of a forwarding pointer, except that at this point, it's not yet forwarded. So the, we would have to preserve the original header, which is, you, you get the idea, it's uh, problematic because we cannot realistically preserve all the headers. Um, so in the third pass, we would go over all the reachable object, objects again and look at all the references that go out from those objects and adjust them to the new locations. So that when we are done at the end, we, all the references are okay. And then finally, in the, in the fourth pass, we would actually copy all the objects to the new location. So this is a bit complicated, but this is how it works. The, comp the tricky part for Lilliput is that we are, again, overriding the uh, mark word with basically no way to preserve the class pointer there. Um, Yeah, so this is already talked about this. So the, the trouble is that where's the mark word now? Um, the idea um, for the Lilliput sliding forwarding is um, we let's divide the heap into a number of regions, which is already the case for G1 and Shenandoah, and it can easily be uh, kind of overlaid for zero GC because this is quite, we can make an arbitrary grid basically over the heap. Um, and then when we slide from the uh, to, towards the bottom, we, the insight is that uh, objects from any region S can only ever be slid to one of two target regions, T1 or T2, because the, 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 basically the, the space is shrinking. It's not never expanding. So this is the basic insight here. So I'm, I'm only scratching the surface here now. So we have a side table which stores for each region the, the indices of the possible targets, T1 or T2. And then the forwarding and coding would be like the two tag bits again to indicate the forwarded objects. And then one bit to select the target region, T1 or T2, which we can look up in the side table, which is quite small. And then we have 29 bits, which basically is, is the, the, the offset from the start of the target region where this object is um, copied into. Um, using this, we can basically address arbitrarily large heaps. Uh, we could just add more regions if we need to. Uh, the side table is fairly small. It's just the number of regions times two entries. It's uh, relatively fast. It's only a little, tiny little bit smaller than a, like more direct encoding. Um, we have a little uh, kind of a problem child here, which is, uh, I'm not going to, Deep into that, it's the G1 serial compaction, which is a last large ditch effort to squeeze out some more uh, memory, and it kind of violates the the uh, original assumption about the two target regions. We solved that by basically adding a fallback hash table here to, to deal with that. Um, so using this, we can. Um, so this is the, the the encoding scheme for these uh, sliding forwarding hashes. We have uh, basically again the the the, target, the tag bits that indicate that it's forwarded, then we have a target selector bit, which selects the one of the two target regions, and then we have the offset, which is 29 bits uh, in, the, in the lower bit uh, parts of the object header. And we preserve the upper, bit, uh, upper uh, uh, class pointer bit, which is important because the GCE might need it. Uh, other interesting information like locked or um, um, hashed Objects we still preserve in the small side structure, but this is uh, not too big. So, right, um, 
with this, um, we basically covered all the ingredients that, that are um, relevant for the Lilliput one. Um, just want to give a quick uh, insight here. So we, we have the we have a JEP up, which is the JEP 450 compact, compact object headers. Uh, it, we, all, we also had a new lightweight locking on, in JDK 21 already uh, under a flag. Um, all the uh, parts are lined up for inclusion in JDK 22. I, uh, I think when I get back from JVMS, I will basically start working on this and get it reviewed and get it into JDK 22. Um, Everything is under a flag currently, so it's it's off by default. If you want to use it, Lilliput in JDK 22, as soon as it arrives, it will be this flag uh, plus use compact object headers. Um, yeah, this is what we have so far. This already works. We see we have some services that already run on this. Um, I I want to look into the future a little bit. Um, talk about what we want to do uh, basically next after we uh, get Lilliput into 22. Um, so first I want to talk about a little bit about the goal that we want to achieve and again about class pointer compression and then about some uh, more advanced topics here about identity hash code. M much of this stuff is not set in stone yet, uh, not even implemented yet. Uh, it's basically ideas how we can approach the different problems there. Um, we probably could have a discussion afterwards, uh, maybe a workshop or in the during the committers workshop. Whoever wants to um, have some some discussion there would be happy to join us. So Lilliput one, I already talked about this. The uh, layout of the object header would look like this. What we want to achieve uh, as an ultimate goal would be uh, this one. We want to squeeze the object header a little more and um, make it even smaller and put. Uh, everything into like just four bit, four bytes or 32 bits. Um, with, we would still have two uh, tag bits there. We would have a we still the set forwarded text there. We have object H that does, is basically unchanged. We only want to have two bits for the hash code, which is I want to talk about a little bit later. And then uh, the rest of the bits would be the compressed class pointer. So look, let's look at class pointer compression. Um, if you count it correctly, we only have, with this scheme, we only have 23 bits for the compressed class pointers. If you make the math, you can uh, address up to a maximum of uh, like 8 million classes with that, which is a lot. Um, I, I'm, I'm, let's say that most workloads, they're used uh, in the area of several thousand classes. There are a couple of exceptions, um, um, kind of applications which are abusing like class generators or maybe lambdas who could probably exceed it. I have never seen it myself. Um, so the, the, the question is here how to deal with um, a possible overflow. However, um, I also want to say that the current class pointer compression scheme that we have in Hotspot is basically limited at 3 million classes, which is, um, yeah. And I have never or very rarely seen applications which exceed that. So with this new scheme that we want to have, which is uh, Thomas Stufel is working on, uh, we want to use fewer bits and can actually uh, address more classes that we can now with compressed class pointers. So I think maybe we should be fine with 8 million classes. Um, we might need to trade some bits here with uh, other features. I'm looking at Valhalla, basically, which is, uh, I heard that this might need like three or four bits here which shrinks the bandwidth that we have for classes here, um, which makes the case for having a fallback for like an overflow case here. Um, the idea might be to just, if, if we overflow this, we, we um, do the mapping in a separate site structure and deal with that in a like less performant way maybe. Um, we need to figure that out. This is basically not, not really a soft problem yet, but there are a couple of ideas around how to deal with that. If it ever becomes a problem, maybe not a problem. Um, that's that. Um, the identity hash code is the next big piece. How to squeeze identity hash code of 31 bit into two bits. Um, let's take a short reminder. Um, whenever the identity hash code is invoked, it needs to return the same integer. This is basically the contract for the identity hash code, which means we could just return one and be happy. Would be a very bad hash code because 
the uh, hash structure would, would basically um, go down the drain, the performance. <laughs> um, so you need to do something there. Um, what, what we currently do in Hotspot is, with the first time we invoke the identity hash code for an object, we basically generate a random number and store it in the header, and then it stays there for the rest of the lifetime of this object. Um, but only very few objects ever get an identity hash code, so this is mostly unused. So what we do here, I, idea is, and I've taken this from another JVM, is to only allocate the space for the hash code when actually needed. Um, use, we, we could use the, uh, the alignment gap at the end of the object because there, for many objects there will be some, some space left. We could use that and if this is not possible because there's not enough room there, we need to allocate a bit more space there. Um, how would that work? Um, so this is the idea. Let's see, this is an object. In the case where we have an alignment gap, which is the small um, light blue uh, area here, we could just put the identity hash code there. Um, the location of the identity hash code would be figured out by looking at the um, class structure. This is actually quite easy. Um, if this is not possible because there is no such space at the end of the object, then we allocate basically on demand a, another word there and put the identity hash code there. So how would that work? Um, we need two bits for that in the object header, and the meaning would be uh, if it's zero, it's not yet hashed. Uh, nobody has called identity hash code yet, so this is the, the default case. Um, if, uh, let's say, zero, one would indicate that the hash code has been called already, but it's not yet installed, the object has not yet mo been moved, so uh, as long as it stays there, we can basically generate the hash code from the object address and it would remain the same. Um, and we have an, we would use a hash function based on the address, of course. Um, and then the, the third case would be the object has been moved by DGC and the uh, new information has been uh, installed at the end of the object. Um, so the GC, when, as soon as the GC moves the object away from its original address, it would have to observe that this object has been identity hashed before and then allocate an extra slot when copying to the new location and then install the hash code that is already computed at the end of the object and then update the, uh, the, the state of the hash code to indicate 1-1. One, one. So this is the basically a trick to allocate on demand as soon as the GC moves the object. So with that, we can uh, basically have uh, only two bits in the header for the, ident uh, for, yeah, for the identity hash code and um, save the space there. Um, another uh, kind of researchy topic is monitor locking. So, um, no, it's not researchy, it's actually quite easy because even if we have those smaller headers, we can still use the um, the space that we have in the first word of, of the original object to point to the new location. Um, that's because we allocate objects aligned by 64 bits. So we can, and, and the information in the original object is not uh, used anymore. It's basically, uh, we can override the first couple of fields too. So we can basically install the forwarding pointer there, reach through it and access the class menu. Still uh, not a problem. What am I saying here? So I was I was I was confusing now. So sorry, I'm, I was talking about GC forwarding, and uh, this is about monitor locking. So for I was uh, jumping a bit uh, ahead. So let's look at monitor locking. Lo monitor locking is problematic because we don't have enough space in the object monitor. Sorry, need to rewind a little bit here. Um, so we only have 32 bits. There's not enough, not enough space to uh, address to, to have a, a full kind of um, um, native pointer to an object monitor. Um, possible solutions, uh, we have a bunch of options here. Um, we could compress the object monitor pointer, similar to how we compress class pointers. This requires that the object monitors get allocated in a special space, maybe in the meta space next to the uh, classes, um, and then have an encoding scheme which basically chops off the unused bits of the address and um, 
that would be an option. Um, another option might be to have a separate um, hash table, which basically establishes the mappings between objects and the ob object monitors. Um, it requires the separate data structure, uh, but it means we don't have to use the, um, the, the object headers for this. And the third option would be what has, has been mentioned before yesterday, I believe, um, the Java object monitor, monitor, meaning completely replace the hotspot object monitor um, infrastructure by uh, something that is completely implemented in Java. So the idea would be to, oh, I'm covering, covering this later, so let's talk about the compressed uh, object monitor pointers. So object monitors are fixed size, so they are each about, it's, it's basically a known size. You can, uh, you could allocate them in a kind of aligned matter uh, in, in meta space, and then we could uh, compress the object monitor pointers pretty much like we compress class pointers right now. Um, and that would fit into 32 or maybe fewer bits, so this, this should be okay. Um, it's problematic for the identity hash code somewhat because the identity hash code, as I described it right now, um, needs the needs the tag bits to indicate uh, the, the actual size of the object. Um, if we only, so this works well if we have uh, two different locations for the old and the new object when it's copied, but if you only have one location to store this information and we copy the object, we don't really know for each of those copies, uh, they have different sizes and we don't really know which is what. So this is a bit of a, of a problem, but it can be solved. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't get, get us rid of the displaced headers, which is kind of what we want. It would be nice to not have to deal with those displaced headers to begin with. Um, putting into to a um, external hash table, is another option um, and eliminates the display headers. It's kind of slow. So right now, in for for locking object monitors, we have fast paths which which are basically implemented in assembly, which are used in C2 compiled locking code. Uh, would be very tricky, I think, to implement concurrent hash table stuff in a assembly code. But I don't know. Uh, pro probably there's ways to deal with that. So we can we could. Uh, also have some sort of either some sort of caching, like we could uh, store the most recently logged uh, object reference in the in the Java thread, and kind of look at that, and then um, keep using the fast fast pass for that. Or we could do something similar that we have done with the identity hash code and allocate the space for the object monitor locking on demand um, as soon as the object gets copied. Um, this is just just ideas, so I'm not really decided yet what we could do. Or Java object monitors. Here the idea is that um, monitor enter and monitor exit bytecodes would be basically completely replaced by static calls into some Java helpers. And those would use Java util concurrent reentrant lock. Um, and the mapping between object and reentrant locks would be established in a Java v concurrent hash maps. Um, I don't know about this project, um, which I believe, I don't remember who's doing that, but um, not quite sure if this aligns with my ideas. The problem still remains that even if we use reentrant blocks, we somehow need to establish the mapping from an object to a uh, kind of reentrant lock here. Um, so this is kind of orthogonal problem. Um, and I'm not sure if using a weak concurrent hash map is feasible at all. So this is something I would like to discuss maybe. Um, yeah, so this is a is an researchy uh, topic. So GC forwarding. Uh, I already jumped the gun here a little bit. We can still keep using the first word of a, of the of the uh, original object to to place the forwarding pointer to the uh, new location. So this is actually not a big deal. Um, we would overwrite the first couple of fields in the original object, but this is not problematic because we are not going to use it anyway. Um, so this is stays the same, and um, self-forwarding would be the same as in Lilliput one. We could keep using the the, the bit here in, in the header. Sliding forwarding would not be possible with the scheme that I explained before because there would not be enough space to keep uh, storing the offsets there. Solution maybe or would be to use a, a very ordinary hash table per region and per space, so we could establish this mapping. This is a bit slower than the sliding forwarding, 
but it's kind of still kind of acceptable, and it's still uh, it's acceptable because I believe the full GC is it's is, is already at the point where the uh, where the performance is basically uh, out of out, out of the window. So uh, if we hit this situation, I believe that the hash table might be a feasible approach there. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, what you need to remember is what you need to do is this flag. What you need to know is in the jab, and what you get is there in this uh, diagram. <laughs> Questions? Where are we time wise? Oh, cool. Time's over. Hmm. Okay. okay, so. Very cool. Um, so it looks like in the first phase, the, the trick that worked was basically let's steal seven bits from the um, you know from the hash code. Yeah. So that's clearly a trade off of something for something. You're yes. getting increased compactness yes. in the heap. Uh, presumably, the trade off is pushing um, to performance cost of data structures like an entity hash map and things yeah. like that. Uh, so what kind of guidance do we have for users about? Uh, what the trade-offs are when they're selecting this, because obviously it's not a free lunch, yeah. and so we should have some guidance to say, yeah. you're getting this, you're giving up that, use your judgment. Right. Um, I'm kind of optimistic that we um, can finish the parts, or that Thomas can finish the parts where we actually don't have to tra make this trade-off to begin with, so we can keep using the uh, 31 bits for the hash code. Um, other than that, and my guidance would be, um, if you're using very large hash tables, you might be better off with the without Lilliput at this point. But uh, I would always suggest to try it. I mean, give it a try and see if it works better or worse, because the, the performance loss by the hash code um, might be less than what you win by Lilliput. Um, this is, yeah, this is always, um, it, it's very hard to say best way to go forward is to actually try it and see if it works better. This is why we, it's good to have this flag. We can uh, make this comparison just by flipping the switch here. So. Other questions? Okay. More questions? Duncan? Um, you, you mentioned um, uh, large hash tables being a problem. I, I assume this is... Uh, really only a problem if you have hash codes that eventually bottom out in a uh, identity hash code rather than yeah. something like strings that are calculated. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, this is, I, I went over this, but identity hash code is basically used yeah. as a kind of a backup hash code when the hash code function, hash code method is not overridden. So I think most of the structures are basically, most of the keys that are used in hash codes are the good citizens and override this hash code to, yeah better implementation themselves. So, yes. So I just want to add something to the uh, the point you just made, Ramon. Uh, so there's also a secret hidden user of identity hash code, which is my favorite feature of serialization. Uh, okay. So when you serialize an object graph, it inflates the identity hash code okay. of every object in the graph forever, right? So um, you know, in addition to classes that don't override ha hash code with a more sensible domain-specific hash code, mm -hmm. anything that's serializable is likely to get it uh, eventually right have their hash code inflated. Okay, right. Good to know. <laughs> but does that impact like performance for serialization, you think? Yeah. Okay, right, yeah. Good point. Yeah, the, 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 the same horrifying sort of thing happens in cloning libraries to make sure they don't clone multiple copies of the same right. thing. So, right. But the, at that point, you're probably doomed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize if you covered this. I was distracted by some work stuff. But what I found is that what really matters is the entropy of the hash code. Yeah. Did you look at trying to increase it? Because my guess is that, and again, you may have covered this, that the default built-in one is actually 
low entropy and actually might be anti to a lot of hash code designs where like okay. they're sequential. So like you get bad performance and things like that. Right. So like the first thing we do when we're looking at hash codes is we actually look at the entropy of the hash code going in, yeah. not the data structure. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just garbage in, garbage out. Right. So like you actually may be able to improve the performance of like serialization if it's using a bad hash code algorithm mm -hmm. and you give it a better hash. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, but by reducing the, the uh, number of bits there, we also reduce the entropy. So this is the trade. Not, not necessarily. Because okay. the, the, there, there may be less information going into it. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, um, algorithms can be sensitive to the entropy of individual bits. Yes. Like a lot of algorithms will do things like just mask off the bottom bits. Yeah, yeah. And if they're all the same, your entropy is one. So yeah. like actually doing things like putting a mic might help. And that's like two instructions. Yeah, sure. Right. Good. More questions? I think we're all the time now. Um, thank you.